How you guys doing this evening? Everybody ready for the word of God tonight? So I get to bring it to you tonight. Um, if you weren't here last week, we just started the book of Acts and uh, Nathan did a great job. But before we get started, I just want to kind of give you what we're going through. And Wednesday night we do verse by verse Bible study. So this book is critical because it gives us like the blueprint of what the church and how the church is supposed to function. And, uh, and it's going to show us what happens when the church is not full of the spirit. And it'll t- show us also what happens when the spirit takes over God's people and then really explodes in the church and when it's full power. Okay. So with that said, it goes like this, it goes like this. God, the father sent Jesus, right? Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit infused the church. So we, we pay attention to the book of Acts, then you will see not only the church, what the church is supposed to do, but you're going to find out what we are supposed to do, what you are supposed to do. So pay attention to this, okay? We're going to experience the power of the kingdom through the work of the church, through the church by the Holy Spirit. That's why when we pray here, you guys, we invite the Holy Spirit. We can't, he's our teacher. So we're asking God to send the Holy Spirit. So let look at um before we go into Acts chapter 2, I just want to revisit Acts chapter 1 verse 8 because this is essential to what we're going to go into. And it says this, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth, right? So let me pray this. Heavenly Father, as we open up the book of Acts chapter 2, we invite the Holy Spirit Lord, I've studied, but move me out of the way and let the Spirit of God talk to your congregation right now. Lord, if it's on my page and you want it removed, don't even let me see it. If you want to add things, have your way with us. But let us have ears to hear from you this evening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So let's look at Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. It says, when the day of the Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And the tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves, and a tongue rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues. And the Spirit was giving them the ability to to speak out. Notice what it said. The spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. Okay. Now let me explain something really quick. Filled with the Holy Spirit. That phrase is used many times in the book of Acts. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And it refers to the spirit coming upon. So think of the spirit coming upon a believer or a group of believers. Okay. The spirit would come upon them and it would always empower them. Spirit would come upon and it would empower us. So that's referred to, as we read in book of Acts, being filled with the Holy Spirit. That is not to be confused with the indwelt of the Holy Spirit or indwelt with the Holy Spirit, okay? When we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that comes with our faith in Jesus Christ. The Spirit comes to a believer. It indwells in us. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in your body, in your heart, and your body becomes the temple now of the Holy Spirit. That makes sense? So the Spirit, however, comes upon to empower us several times in our walk with Christ, right? Throughout the course of a believer's life, you'll see the Holy Spirit come upon us and and it'll do usually basically according to the needs that we have at that time. But the Spirit that indwells us comes one time, right? When it comes on and you accept Christ in in your life and it's upon faith, then it comes one time. So I just want to explain that part. But it said beginning in verse number one, it said the day of Pentecost. So what was the day of Pentecost? This was the Jewish feast held 50 days after the Passover. And it was celebrated the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So in the Jewish rituals at that time, the first sheep reaped from the barley harvest was presented to God at Passover. But at Pentecost, the first fruits of the wheat harvest was presented to God. So therefore, Pentecost is called the first day of the first fruits. 
So anytime a pastor speaks to you guys, I like to give you guys scriptures so you can go back and fact check. So I'm going to give you the scriptures as we go through. We can't go through everything tonight in the amount of time, but look at Numbers 28 verses 26 for you, uh, if you guys are note takers, and I'll kind of explain that. Jewish tradition also taught in Pentecost that marked the day of the law was given to Israel. So the Jews sometimes call Pentecost, this is the word, Zeman Mantu Torah, which means or the season of the giving of the law. That's what that meant. So the Old Testament day of the Pentecost, Israel received the law, okay? On the New Testament, the day of Pentecost, the church received the spirit of grace and fullness. So when the day of Pentecost has fully come, right? This is what it says in scripture. When the day of Pentecost has fully come, it was now 10 days after Jesus had ascended to heaven. And uh, Nathan did a good job. He went over Acts 1. So if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 3, you'll see that, okay? And since Jesus commanded them to wait for the Holy Spirit, he told them to wait. The disciples, you got to remember, they weren't strangers to the Holy Spirit, right? They weren't strangers to what Jesus was doing because they followed him and they saw Jesus continually doing things through the Holy Spirit in his ministries. The disciples experienced something of the power of the Spirit when they stepped out and they started serving God. Here's another scripture that you guys can look at. Look at Luke Chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. Read through that, and it will see, show you what the disciples were doing, okay? Then the disciples heard Jesus promise this new coming of the Holy Spirit. Look at uh, John 14. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and he will be in you. And I love this part right here. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. Love that part. So the disciples receive the Holy Spirit in a new way, right? After Jesus finished his work on the cross and instituted this new covenant, now Jesus, the disciples received it in a new way. Look at John 20. It says this, or John verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 19. It says, now when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were together due to the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you, right? And when he said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent, sent me, I also send you. Verse number 22. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, then they have been retained. So let's unpack that. So the disciples heard Jesus command for them first to wait. He told them to wait because he promised this baptism of the Holy Spirit. But they didn't know how long they had to wait because he just ascended. It could have been that afternoon. I mean, think about this. He's telling you, wait. You're like, well, maybe he'll come back later this afternoon, or maybe he'll come back in three days, or maybe he'll come back in seven days, but it was 10 full days that it took him to come back. Now, the only possible, as I was researching this, the only possible scriptural precedent for this might be Jeremiah 42.7. Look at what it says here in Jeremiah 42.7. It says, now at the end of 10 days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after in the 10 days, see, God is a God of order. Things kind of make sense. When you unpack your Bible, there's usually, depending on your Bible, you have references that you can go to. You have other scriptures. I encourage you not just to read there, but look back. Tie these things together. It all makes sense. It is the living word of God. It's the breathing word of God. 
Well, who would have suspected that? God could use that time, which he uses for us today. I think sometimes he uses us to be patient and wait, right? So he can break us down a little bit and then build us back up. So I can imagine that they were in this time that they were impatient or maybe it was testing their, their kindness or their compassion was being tested, yet they all stayed together. When we talked on Sunday about the vision of this church and we asked you guys to go into prayer, that's what I see, it. all stand together. Don't separate, don't let it cause division. Let's stay together and see what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. And I believe he will show us the cool thing about the Holy Spirit, let me show you this. I gave them a few things, bullet points. The gift of the Holy Spirit is promised to us. Um, that's one thing that we, that the, the gift is always promised to us. All we have to do is receive it by faith, right? But it's promised to us. The gift of the Holy Spirit is promised to us. The gift of the Holy Spirit is worth waiting for because there's power in that. Jesus living in you, there's power in that, Right? The gift of the Holy Spirit comes as he wills, often not according to our expectations, right? And there, in that first four verses, it came suddenly. It was like a win. It was automatic. But sometimes it's not that way. But it will come in his will, right? The gift of the Holy Spirit can come upon not only individuals, but it can come on groups. That's why we're asking the church to pray, Pastor Russell and I can pray all day long, but the power of the Holy Spirit, when all of us who have the Holy Spirit in us are praying, then I believe without a shadow of a doubt, God is going to move in, those, in our prayer, okay? The gift of the Holy Spirit is often given as God deals, listen to this, with the flesh and there is a dying to ourself. Remember, the Word of God tells us to die to ourselves. So he's dealing with us there. And once we start dying to ourselves, it increases what the Holy Spirit will do inside of us. What we, what the Holy Spirit, this passage does not say, it doesn't say that the Holy Spirit is some type of formula. And it doesn't say that the Holy Spirit, you can get the Holy Spirit by seeking it, right? It doesn't say any of that. It's by faith that we receive that. Scripture also says that they were all one accord in one place. So they were gathered together. Think about this. They were gathered together. They were sharing the same heart, sharing the same love for God, and they had the same trust in his promises, and they were in the same geographic area. So before we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, we got to recognize that we need to empty ourselves out. You got to empty yourself to be filled, right? You got to empty yourself. And I think this is what the disciples are doing because they're gathering in prayer. They're being obedient. And then the disciples is doing this very thing. They're recognizing that we don't have the resources that we need or we could have or we should have. They needed to rely on God. Who is that message for today? We try by our own might and our own power to do things in this world today, and we really need to rely on God's power, not our own. I can tell you it's so much easier when we rely on God than to rely on myself. I find myself spinning around in circles, but when I rely on God, it seems like a piece of cake. That's what Lot would say, piece of cake, right? Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. It said suddenly. Remember, I said it can come in at any time. And this association with this sound was like, it said it was like a mighty wind. So imagine that, this room right now, you guys, if a mighty wind just started, I mean, you could hear it audible, right? Imagine that. But it's probably connected to the fact that both in Hebrew and Greek, Hebrew and Greek, the word spirit as Holy Spirit is the same word as breath, right? Or wind, or breathe, right? This also happens to be the same in Latin. So here, they hear this sound from heaven, and the Holy Spirit is being poured out on the disciples. And the sound of this mighty wind. And it, we see this in illustration in the Bible itself, because if you go back, remember I said, I'm going to give you scriptures. You got homework too. Don't just listen to the, uh, the, the pa pastor speak. Go back and look at the Bible. So here's some verses for you. First, Book in the Bible, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, right? I didn't give these to them, but I want you guys to write this down if you're note takers, because it says that in the Spirit of God, he breathed, 
right? The wind of God blowing over the waters of this newly created earth. So think about that wind again. And Genesis 2 verse 7 is the spirit of God breathing the wind into creation of man. He breathed into and created man, right? And Ezekiel 37, 9 and 10, it speaks of the spirit of God breathing of God moving dry bones on it, of uh, Israel, bringing them out to life and strength. So we see this breathing, this breath of fresh air. And I know when, when, um, when I'm relaxing or when I'm in my prayer time, I'm asking that for that refreshing. I don't know about you, but how, how many of you guys are like, like the beach and the water? Like how many of you guys are mountain people, like the hike and stuff? Okay. I'm the water. Per- when, I, when I'm in my meditation, I like to hear running water. I like to hear the ocean. I like to hear that part. It just gets me in this, this mood. And then that cool breeze that comes by, just that breath of fresh air. So I just look at that and I said, well, that's what God did when he made man. He just, just breathed into us. All right, so the, the, this line tells us that the Holy Spirit moves, right, suddenly. Sometimes God moves suddenly, right? This tells us that the Holy Spirit, it was sound there. There was sound. And it's really, it's, it's incredible because you can't touch sound. You can't touch wind, right? It has to come from hearing. You have to hear it, right? It tells us that the Holy Spirit came from heaven, it wasn't earth, it wasn't man-made, it wasn't manipulated, it wasn't created. It came from heaven, right? And it says it was mighty, full of force, coming with great power. I think sometimes we dismiss the power of the Holy Spirit. See, when Jesus left, he left the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended, he left the Holy Spirit. So the same power that Jesus had lives in us. And how many times we feel like we can't exercise that power. You guys can pray for us just like we can pray for you. But some reason if we have the title pastor, then it seems like we got more weight. Like we're more in line. The same Holy Spirit that lives in me lives in you. The exact same one. So you can say, Pastor, come here. Let me pray for you. I had little Robert, like three years old. Pastor, I want to pray for you. I posted on my Facebook and he put his hand on my head. I'm like, okay, pray for me, Robert. Because he's got the same, the same Holy Spirit in him. So there appeared to be this tongue, this phenomenon, right? These tongues are, are landing on them. And it's probably connected to John the Baptist. Look at Matthew uh, 3.11. He says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Wow. Now the idea of fire being mentioned there is usually a purification, right? We, we see refiners making pure gold with fire, right? But fire can also burn away these temporary things, leaving only the things that'll last. How many of you guys seen a burned out building? It's all burned, but the building is still, the foundation is still just burned out. Only leaving the things that last. That's an excellent illustration in the principle of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not just the abstract of power, but it's purity. It's purifying, okay? So under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit rested on God's people. And that's the nation of Israel. But under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit rests upon God as individuals. The tongues that was mentioned there, the fire sat Upon each of them. And this strange phenomenon never happened before and never happened again in the Bible. Never mentioned again. This is to emphasize, you guys, that the Spirit of God is present with, in, and upon each individual. That's what I'm describing. That same Spirit lives in you that believe. The exact same Spirit. So this is the coming and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And it was so good, so essential that... Look at what Jesus said. I mean, Jesus had to think this was so great that it would be better if I leave. Because look at John 16, 7. Look what he says. He said, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I'm leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's amazing. Like, I, 
let me leave so I can send you this helper. You guys realize you have a helper in the Holy Spirit that resides in you. I like to say, let me just try to activate that in my life. Let me pray for something that this person, only God, and I'm like, God, reveal this to me. Let your Holy Spirit speak to me. I've prayed for people that didn't even tell me what their problem was, and God was able to show me and tell me to pray for this specifically for that individual, and that's what they were suffering with. I didn't have, there was one time there was a guy, he was going, he uh, lost a family member, and he was flying back to uh, another state for the funeral. And as he's walking out, he said, Pastor, can you pray for me? I'm going to a funeral. And I said, oh, sure, I'll pray for you. So I'm starting to pray this, you know, this traveling prayer, protection. You're going to be in the air flying. And then God told me he's going to run into some obstacle with his family members over there. And you need to pray this specifically about the relationships that's going to happen. And I'm like, where is this coming from? In the middle of my prayer. So I stopped praying and I said, hey, God just revealed something. I need to pray again. Because God showed me this. And then I prayed that. And he called me from there. Pastor, this is exactly what happened. I can't believe it. can't believe what's going on. They, they, they're telling me that. And this is going on. And I said, well, we pray. You're lifted up in prayer, brother. Just trust in the Lord. Let's pick up verse number five. Now, there were, there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them were hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astounded saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parathians, Medes, Elamites, And the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Figuri, and Paphilia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya, and Cyrene, and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongue of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement. And great perplexity saying to one another, what does this mean? But others who were jeering and saying, this is, they're full of sweet wine. So they're saying they're drunk, right? So let me break this down a little bit. Um, It begins that they're speaking in tongues in the response of the Holy Spirit. Those present, the 12 apostles, begin to speak in other languages, you guys, Typically, with that, when I was studying this, they're not understanding the exact language that they're speaking, but the other people were understanding it. It's like me starting to speak Spanish, and I don't know what I'm saying, and everybody that speaks Spanish can relate to exactly what I'm saying, right? Think of that. And then it said, devout men from every nation under heaven. So the multitude from many nations gathered in Jerusalem because it was the feast of Pentecost, Right? So many of these were the same people who gathered in Jerusalem um, after the Passover. And remember that angry mob that demanded that Jesus be executed? Many of them were probably there in that crowd. And when, they, when the sound occurred, the crowd quickly gathered. We don't know if they gathered because they, the wind or they heard them speaking. But we know that they, they gathered. And apparently the Christians could be heard from the windows of the upper room. And I wanted to show you guys a photo because we know it wasn't a house. A house with, couldn't fit 120 people. So it probably looked something like this in the upper rooms, like there was a, a lot of people in that area. And as they're speaking and as they're hearing this, this, uh, this uh, speaking in tongues, if you will, they're hearing this, they're probably peeking out of the windows and looking out on the balconies and looking from like, what is that coming from? They're, everybody is captured by this. And they, they, they were saying, asking themselves, what are they hearing, right? What did they hear them say when they were speaking, all these voices? Well, he says, um, we hear them speaking in our tongues, the wonderful works of God. That's what it says in the scripture. They were hearing them speak the wonderful works of, of God. So this is, was amazing that they are remarkable, right? That they could hear this. 
But some of them believed that, you know, they were amazed. They were saying, well, that's, that they, they were perplexed. And they, they generally asked the question. They were saying, hey, what could this mean? So you have people that are asking, what can it, what, what does this mean? But others tried to dismiss, dismiss the, the power of God. Because that's the ones that said they're full of wine, right? See, people are not used to seeing the supernatural. You guys all have a natural ability. Some of you guys are musicians, artists. You guys can sew and knit and work on cars, whatever. You have a natural gift. It's the supernatural. Don't get freaked out when you hear the word supernatural, because here's here's what I wrote down. Supernatural events refers to being there's events. There's abilities, there's occurrences, there are uh, things that transcends the laws of nature and cannot be explained by science or logic. That's what supernatural is. You can't explain it away. Something had to happen there that was supernatural. So this is what they're seeing. And then they were looking at these Galileans speaking in this language. Now, you got to remember, in those times, the people that were Galileans they were known to be uncultured. They were known to be poor speakers. They were, that was even more reason that they were amazed that they were speaking in this eloquent way because they weren't known to do that. So they're asking, what could this mean? Speaking in tongues has a focal point and significant controversy today, you guys. People still ask the same questions that those bystanders were asking back then. So here, let me give you this. Let's address the elephant in the room, okay? There's no controversy that God at least one time gave the church the gift of tongues. But much of the controversy centers around the question, what is the the purpose of him doing that? So I'm going to give you this so you can look at it. Here's your homework. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Just read that chapter. Okay, that'll help you out. But here's the thing. Some of them believe that Speaking in tongue um, as means as a miraculous communication of the gospel in these diverse languages. And they believe that that's no longer needed for this sign. So they regard the tongue as a gift that is no longer in their, their presence in church today. That's not where we stand. The other side of the argument is that while the sign that, that the, the unbeliever are stated by 1 Corinthians 14, this is still in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, are primarily a gift to communicate between the believer and God, okay? And it's still a gift today. So one part says, no, that was the old time. It was just, they were speaking then, and then the the new, uh, the other side of the coin is that, no, it's still used today. Many mistakenly interpret this incident in Acts chapter 2, assuming that the disciples used their tongue, listen to to preach, to speak the the word of God. So that doesn't seem to be the case, and we'll hit that in a little bit. We believe that God still uses the speaking in tongue. I know there's several people that can has the gift today, speak in tongue. But it's not giving, like most gifts. Nobody has all of the gifts, and some people have some gifts, And and some people have the gift of speaking tongue. I believe it's prevalent in today's society. And I believe that people can still speak in tongue. So how they use it. Here's here's what I want to be clear on. The gift of tongue has an important place in the devotional life of a believer. But it's a small place in the corporate life of a church. So you can look at, again, 1 Corinthians 14. Read through that. Listen carefully. When tongue, when the tongue, the gift of tongue is practiced in a corporate setting or corporate life of the church, it must be carefully controlled and never without interpretation given by the Holy Spirit. That's our stance as a church. It has to be interpreted by the Holy Spirit. So people can't just, they can. I, I'll tell you, when I was like eight or nine years old, I was going to my, my, um, grandmother's church and I thought I heard everybody speaking in tongue and I thought oh I'm not saved so I gotta start speaking so I just start saying whatever I was listening to what they were saying thinking if I don't do this I'm not saved 
It's not what we believe, you guys. You, that's a gift. God will give you the gift, okay? So look at verse number 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the other 11, raised his voice. He raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem know this and pay attention to my words. So Peter stood up to speak to the people in the known language. We know Peter was speaking Greek when he started to speak to them, when he started teaching. So those people that were speaking in tongues at that time probably be quiet. They probably stopped, right? So the message could be heard. Here's something we should notice carefully, you guys. We should notice that speaking in tongues stopped when Peter began to preach. Think about that. It stopped when Peter began to speak. Why? The Holy Spirit was now working through Peter, right? And it's not going to work against himself. The Holy Spirit's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to be speaking here and working through Peter. God is a God of order. So as soon as he started working through Peter, everybody else became, that's why we have a, a, a gift and uh, the spirit of self-control. Just they control themselves and they stop speaking and and tongues, okay? But what we see from Peter was remarkable because he changed his whole turn. Now, in verse 15, he says, for these people are not drunk, as you assume, since it's only the third hour of the day. Peter was like raising his voice. We see this boldness now because now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you guys, when you got filled with the Holy Spirit, got bold? You want to start telling everybody about Christ and like, I want to just go tell at the gas station, hey, you heard about Jesus? You just get kind of this bold and this, this, this thing is alive. But what happens and what the devil wants us to do is suppress that. He wants us to quench that. So you're standing there and you're like, I should talk to that person. But no, if they make eye contact, no, I'm not going to. We, we, we want to suppress that, that gift, right? But you see Peter right here, he's getting remarkable. Peter says he's got courage. He's got boldness. He starts speaking. He didn't wake up in the morning with this written down powerful message, but he had this well-prepared sermon that he talked about. And Peter's, prior to his life with God, his relationship with Jesus, it flowed spontaneously out of that life, out of his mind, deeply inside of his, his heart. So it's good to remember that we have Acts chapter two as a small portion of what Peter actually said. We're gonna get into Acts chapter two when we get to verse number 40. You'll see what he's, as he's preaching. And, and he says, it goes along the lines that, that, and when many other words he testified and exhorted himself. So like almost all the sermons recorded in the Bible, what we have is the Holy Spirit inspiring us. We always, as I said, you guys, we always invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. Some of you guys, the presence of the Holy Spirit enters in as soon as you start worshiping, right? As soon as you, the words pop up on the screen and your hands are lifting, some of you guys enter right there. The Holy Spirit, you feel that presence. I've seen on our first Wednesdays, this whole altar full and people on their knees crying out to God. The Holy Spirit is filling up this, the presence of the room, right? These people were thinking they were drunk. You know, when we start being bold for Christ, people are going to think we're crazy. People are going to look at us like we're drunk. How I many, they probably send that to us now. Like, look at these guys. They, they, those Christians, oh my goodness. That's what, they're, that's what they're, they're doing. But Peter was deflecting this criticism. He's deflect, he even said, they don't even drink like at nine o'clock in the morning. There's a commentator named Adam Clark. He says that Jews did not eat or drink after the third hour of the day because it was a time for prayer and they would only eat after they had their business with God. So Peter was using that too and saying like, they, they're not drunk. They don't even drink till after that. All right, let's pick it up because we're running out of time. Look at verse number 16. Well, let me back up a little bit. Let me back up. Before, before I share this passage, I want you to know Peter is, is referencing Joel in chapter 2, the book of Joel. You can take that off the screen. Joel chapter 2. And I want to make this point as we read through this 
chapter 2. We're going to read through this together. Joel is talking about the last days of the last days. So he was talking about the time when Jesus returns, when the wrath of God was poured out on the earth, and when the Jews who survived, the Jews survived the great tribulation, um, and he's talking about that period of time. So you're going to see Joel actually mention survivors, right? So Joel's prophecy isn't about the day of Pentecost. It's not about Pentecost. You may ask, if it's not about Pentecost, then why did Peter quote it? And this is where chapter, verse number 16 comes in. He quoted it because he says, but this is what has been spoken through the prophet Joel. Okay? In other words, Peter is saying that this is what Joel was talking about in his prophecy. Now that the prophecy is about is about that time of, it's not about the time of Pentecost, it's about the time of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? This is what Peter is seeing. And so he's saying, Joel spoke about this outpouring way back then. And these were Jewish people, so they should have known. He's saying, you guys, this should not be a surprise to you guys. This is the stuff that God talked about. So Joel wasn't, let me make it clear, wasn't talking about a particular outcome necessarily. He was talking about the outcome that was going to happen when Jesus returns at the end of the great tribulation to the survivors of Israel. So an outpouring is an outpouring is an outpouring. That's what he's talking about. So remember, he did not say that this is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. He didn't say that. He simply said, this is what Joel is talking about. This is what he uttered, okay? So let's look at that passage together, and this is what it says in Joel 2. Look at verses 28. It says, it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall have dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in heaven and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. Now, in verse number 30 right there, this did not happen at Pentecost. He's talking about the tribulation period and the conclusion. Verse number 31, it says the, sh the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said. And among the, what, survivors shall be those who the Lord calls. So what did you see here? He referenced world events and Joel's prophecy, right? You hear him talking about the sun being dark and you hear him talking about the moon turning to blood, but those are all tribulation terms that he's using. And he talked about survivors and those who will escape. Again, we're not talking about Pentecost. Joel is just t using this time frame to talk about this outpouring. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Peter is not saying that Pentecost is a fulfillment it's just a reference point so we understand that the outpouring of the, the Spirit, and then Peter went on to speak about Jesus, the person. So it's important that we recognize, you guys, that when we're going to look at Peter and what I encourage you guys to do, when someone talks to you about your faith, when somebody comes up to you and asks you about your faith or a question about your faith, answer the question. Always answer the question, the question that they have, but always bring it back to Jesus. Always answer their question, but always bring it back to Jesus Christ, okay? Always. It's more important that they know about Jesus Christ than anything else. But don't ignore their questions, okay? Church is all about Jesus Christ, all right? So what did Peter teach in verse number 22? You're going to have to come back next week. You're going to have to, I left the cliffhanger there. Remember those movies? I told you when you're like, oh, I was just getting, P 
Peter's are going to talk about what happens next, but uh, we're going to leave it right there at verse number 22. And what I want to do, you guys, is I just want to invite those. I see a lot of familiar faces. So, you know, the, the Holy Spirit always tells us that don't lean on our own understanding, right? So sometimes when I get up to do an altar call, I go, all these people are already saved. I'm going to do an altar call and nobody's going to raise their hand because I know all these people. And God's like, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, don't do that. You always end your sermon with the altar call because it doesn't matter if it's just one person. And I don't know how your week has been. I don't know what happened, right? So with that said, I want to give you an opportunity. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, all I want you to do is raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you right where you sit. If you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ, I just want to see your hand. Just slip it up and I'm going to pray for you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see those hands over there. Church, let's bow our head and just pray with them. Let's invite them back into the presence of the Lord. Father God, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I believe you died and you rose again. Lord, I invite you into my heart right now. Lord, I invite the Holy Spirit to guide me. Lord, show me how to pray. Show me how to read my Bible. Show me how to commit to coming to my church, Lord. And speak to me through your worship. Speak to me through the message. And speak to me through my reading and understanding. Reveal yourself to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody can say, Amen. Would you stand up and worship with us? God bless you guys.